All right. So what I wanted to show you is this is not part of this class yet, but it will be part of all my classes soon. I've got a Google Cloud server here running Linux with various junk installed on it as usual. And the only thing special about this server is I made it much more powerful than usual. I get four cores and 15 gigs of RAM and a 40 gigabyte SSD to make it as fast as possible. And then I have a Chrome desktop on it. And this is in the exploit development class, it's ED290. You can get a graphical environment on a cloud Linux server this way. You just install this thing called Chrome Remote Desktop. Then you can install any desktop environment you want, but XFCE is one of the lightweight ones, it's fine. And then you can put Firefox on it. And then you um, go into Chrome and create an author, you log into to Google, and you can create an authorization key with a process here from this Chrome Remote Desktop page, and you get a line of code that you have to execute on the cloud machine. And once you do that, you run that on the cloud machine, you can then connect from Chrome Remote Desktop here. And that's what I've got here. This is a graphical environment on my cloud Linux machine. So now I can run graphical applications like Firefox and Wireshark, and that's cool. But what I really want to do is to run emulated machines here. And so to do that, um, I have two of them already working. This project is not published yet because I'm planning to add something to it. This is going to be exploit development 410 because these are going to be the environments for attacks. I want to expand the ARM and Android attacks. And so I need to have a good emulator for ARM and Android. So, but anyway, just to show you that it works, I'm going to download FreeDOS. So I need to go to sourceforge.net. Now, one thing that, of course, doesn't work very well is copy and paste. That, that never seems to work very well in any of these emulated or remote control environments. It occasionally works, but it seems to fail more often than it works. So that's uh, an irritation that you, I haven't found any way out of. Now, somewhere should be internet or something. Um, well... I don't seem to have Firefox, all right? Perhaps I forgot to install Firefox. So let me do that if I can get to the project. Okay, so here, to install Firefox, <coughs> you have to do this, okay? So I'm, I could do that in the GUI, but it's simpler to do in the old-fashioned command prompt here. Okay, uh, that's installing Firefox apparently. Okay, good. <coughs> Firefox, for some stupid reason, is not in the usual archives of apt. It's in the snap archives. Snap is a different install framework intended for mobile devices. So anyway, and I've installed it there. And I think it will now just appear here. If I right click applications, now I have internet Firefox. So, okay. So now I got Firefox. And I want to download the free DOS image that we used on Windows in Box in another class to make boot from the practical model analysis class to start doing boot sector viruses. Um, that's what was what we've been doing this week in that class. But I want to do it on Linux to make it more powerful. And let's see if I can. Um... Okay, so. I'm in Firefox and I want to find the name of the page I'm trying to go to, which is, if I can get junk out of the way on my desktop. Um, I seem to have lost the page. Here we are, key moment. This is what I wanted to do. I wanted to go to this page, sourceforge.net project box. So let's see if I can copy and paste. And apparently I can't. All right, sourceforge. .NET, project, box, okay, and I have to see it's project S box files, okay, now that's interesting, box files, all right, now I made it into the box emulator, these, these are uh, these images which you can run in emulator, they're sort of like virtual machines, the reason why they're different than virtual machines is that everything is emulated, including the processor. And vert, that makes the, and things much slower, but it means you can do exciting stuff like analyze ARM software on an Intel base. That's why I want to do this. I want to have ARM virtual machines on a cloud machine on Intel. So anyway, here I want to find FreeDOS, which is here. 
just as an example of a different operating system to run. And here is the FreeDOS file that includes the hard drive. So I want to download it. And here it comes. I don't care about your stinking social networks. Oh, good. There it goes. I want to save this. Okay. And now that it's in there, I want to do this stuff. Um, this, when you download things in Snap Firefox, they go in this stupid folder. And so let me um, execute this stuff here. If I shrink this, now I can open a terminal, which is applications system XFCE terminal to get a pretty terminal. And now I can CD into, whoa, snap Firefox common downloads. Okay, and now I can LS. And there's the file I want FDOS, so I tar it, XZVF, FDOS. And that created a bunch of files here. And now I can copy one of those files, which is FDOS, um, FDOS Mini, which we we're using in the other class. And I can put it in my home folder. So now I can access it more easily. And now, I think I've already installed Kimu, so this is just as far as I wanted to go to show it to you. This one line is all you have to do. I can now run Kimu, Q-E-M-U, and there are different in, in, launchers for different hardware platforms. There's a Kimu ARM, a Kimu Android, a Kimu Power PC. There's like dozens of them that emulate different kinds of hardware. And now you tell it about your drive, and my drive is format equals raw file equals fdos there and that's all i need now it launches the virtual machine here and as you can see this is booting up dos just like the box application did on windows and so i now have dos running over here and linux underneath it and it's all in the cloud and so I've gotten Alpine Linux running here too, which is another thing I really wanted to use because uh, there were some CTF puzzles I had where they had this fantastically small download, like 50 megs. It was a whole running Linux you could attack. And I found out they did that with Alpine Linux. So I got Alpine Linux running here. And the, uh, the thing I'm in the process of writing is to get Android running there. And I'm pretty sure it's going to work because I was able to get through the installer, but then it was too slow to boot up. I think I just needed to make the machine more powerful. So... The projects, if you want to do this, they will be up very soon. The first project is already up, ED290. This is where you get a graphical desktop on a Cloud Linux server. So you can do all kinds of graphical things. And ED410 is going to be this one, where you start running the Kimu emulator. Now, the box emulator we used in the malware analysis in, the, um, in some class, malware analysis, to start writing boot sector viruses. And we could do that here too, but my immediate application is just to get more operating systems available without anybody ever having to use a local piece of junk like VMware or VirtualBox because those things just haven't worked for two years. About half students with old hardware and old operating systems can use them, but students with modern versions of Windows and modern hardware are pretty much out of luck. Those things just haven't worked. And every time they do work, Microsoft puts out another update every month to break it again, which is really frustrating a lot of people. So anyway, um, so this is the new hotness, and I just wanted to show you that, but um, now I'm going to go back to the regular stuff. I think I saw a chat message go by. Let's see what that is. Did I miss the date? I did not bother with the news today, because I wanted to show people Kimu instead. Anyway, um, the so... I should also say we're coming to the end of the semester and people are always concerned about their grades. So I remind you, Canvas will show you some stupid percentage. Just ignore that. The only thing that matters is the total number of points. And I will add a comment at the top of the Canvas page telling you how many points you need for A and B and a C and so on within the next week. I haven't gotten around to it yet, but that's all that matters is the point total. Anyway, and there's lots of extra credit available. If you need extra credit, you can do this go. There's 300 points of extra credit there. There's lots of other things to do. Anyway, um, so what I wanted to 
do is carry on with we are here in 152 and we are back in windows artifacts this is uh classical forensic stuff and very important stuff so if i go here um we are down here we're going to finish part two and, and do the first part of part three we may not finish it today but that's all right we have some extra time in the last class and um these are windows artifacts so um it is here and that's part three but we didn't quite finish part two so let's go back up here to part two the last bit of part two is here so there's just an awful lot of things on what windows does to track everything you do and forensic investigators have to know about it or instant response the same thing you're going to go to a windows machine and find out what people have been doing you can totally find out a lot about what they've been doing and none of it is intentional spying. You could actually install spyware, like parents do this to their children, that tracks where they are and how fast their car is driving and stuff, and records every keystroke and stuff. But even if you don't, Microsoft records a ridiculous amount of information. So um, the user hive is real important because it is specific to each logged in user. So everything in the user hive, you automatically know who did it. Other things, it may not record who did it, it'll just record the time something was done. So this is in your ntuser.dat, and some information is in userclass.dat, but all the stuff I've ever seen that's fun is in ntuser.dat. These files are in your profile, so every user has their own one. And this is why when you boot up the machine, it creates the registry in RAM by adding together the five highest files it finds on the disk. And then when you log in, it adds more stuff to the registry, which it finds here. Now that it knows who you are, it loads personalizations for you, like your background on the desktop and all these other settings, like all the windows you've been opening, all the programs you've been opening, where your windows were last on the desktop and all kinds of other things to personalize it to you. So that's the game here. And so if you wanna find compromised accounts, this is one place to do it. You can find out who's been running what. And typically if an attacker is attacking your company, they will do, obvious non-normal abnormal things like if they are stealing data they will go to some folder gather together a whole bunch of files and then zip them with something like winrar install winrar just to do that then delete winrar then send them off then delete all the files and those are characteristic actions that you can find here so anyway check to see all the user accounts and remember there are machine accounts like network service and local system and your smarter attackers will use those to penetrate a network because people don't usually look there because nobody logs in interactively with those accounts, but they still do um, leave traces on the machine. So here's the general information about the user specific keys, shell bags, user assist, and these other ones are records kept of what you've been doing on the machine. Shell bags keep track of where the windows were and what view they had. Was it like large icons or small icons? and uh, all that. So every time you open a window, it records where you left that window. So the next time you open it, it'll pop up in the same spot on the desktop where you apparently like it. And that of course is keeping track of everything. And this is not tied very closely to the actual window. So even if you delete a folder, like if you create a folder, fill it with stuff you're stealing, zip it, put it on a USB drive, and then delete that folder, the shell bag will still record that that folder was there. So this is like so many things in Windows, you can look in the history and see what happened, even if the criminal thinks they've hidden their tracks. <coughs> so you'll find it here in the, under your SID, your security identifier, which is unique for each user. So this has date and time and access to all these various times when they were last accessing that machine, and that's very handy. You can see just what folders everybody's been going to if they use the mouse and the graphical desktop. So you have to get a special tool to do it, but here's SBAG, one of the many tools that does it. And you see folder names, when they were open, when they were created, and so on. So you can see just what somebody's doing here. Then there's user assist, and the point of this is all the um, executables are recorded and how many times you ran them and when you last ran them because Microsoft wants you to know what you appear to be your favorite program so it can load them faster and cause them to come higher in menus and stuff. So again, all that information is saved. User Assist only tracks things open via Explorer, not from the command prompt, but prefetch files, remember prefetch files do not tell you which user launched the application because prefetch is used 
during system boot up before you log in. So it doesn't have any information about who's going to use the computer, but it wants to prefetch some files because you have a bunch of RAM just sitting there that's not being used, and it wants to preload those programs into RAM because they seem to be popular, but it doesn't know who you are. So prefetch knows what has been used and when it was last used, but it doesn't know who launched it. But user assist always tells you who's been doing things because it's, you can tell who's NTUser.data gen. So, you know, they're both useful, but you have to understand they have different information. Another thing that's pretty hilarious is user assist, for some stupid reason, Microsoft decided to make it more private. So if you have Chrome, it actually stores it in ROT13 encryption. Um, the actual, this is decoded by this um, registry viewing tool, but the actual thing stored is P-U-E-B-Z-R which is Chrome with all the letters rotated 13 in the alphabet, which is incredibly stupid. I don't know why anybody thinks that conceals information, but Microsoft apparently feels that this makes you more private. Uh, anyway, it's just, this is very handy in all my cryptography classes and public lectures and stuff. This is an example of incredibly stupid encryption. Like, why would anybody think that this hides anything? Anyway. Then there's MUI case. Microsoft Windows is a multi-language OS. And if you take Windows desktop support or server classes, you'll learn you can install like English and Japanese on every machine in your enterprise and have a button everyone can click to go to English or Japanese and it supports you know all the popular languages, all the commercially significant languages, they call it. So it has a bunch of special settings just to record the multi-user settings. And there's a bunch of registries for that. Um, there are most recently used keys. This is a big thing. If you know, if you open any application like Notepad or anything, you can click File and you'll see a list down here of the recently opened files. That is done by the registry. That is not done by the developer of this application. The operating system keeps track of what files you've been opening in order to populate that list. So that's pretty awesome. Now, if you want to clear the MRU list, it's quite a chore, and there's a special tool just to delete it. Just like if you want to clear the Google cookies off your machine, God have mercy on you, you can run gzapper. The problem is, if you use the internet, they immediately all come back, because Google is on every page on the internet for all practical purposes. And so, unless you hide in a closet and don't use the internet, I don't know what good your machine is without putting a bunch of Google cookies back on it. But anyway, you can clear things with these tools if you want to. Uh, there's also stuff like evidence eliminator people download to try to conceal what they'd be doing. In general, if you're using a Windows machine and you want to conceal what you've been doing, just forget it. Unless you just mechanically destroy the hard disk or erase it with a forensic utility. Um, I highly doubt that anything convenient to use is really going to hide the evidence from a competent forensic investigator, but you might be able to hide it from like an amateur, like other members of your family that might just look at the internet favorites and the internet history. It deletes the stuff that's just right in front of your face, but I don't, I highly doubt it gets all these traces. Anyway, um, so open and save. If you open a file, again, it records what folder you were last in when you opened a file and what view it was in and all that jazz. So Red Ripper is one of the registry viewing tools and it can find these things, a bunch of records that show what you've been opening and saving in a file open and a file save dialog. And here's things you've launched from the run box. Um, so start run and you type in a command and all those commands are saved right here in the run MRU. So you see this person ran explorer.exe and then CMD and then reg edit and so on. All the things they typed in the run box are just stored here. So you can see what they've been doing. Recent docs records all the recently opened documents. They're in a special folder. There are shortcuts to them. So you can find recently opened documents. You'll find it here in a folder with a long path ending in recent docs. Um, and there's special records of things you type. This is something I use, use a lot. When I used Firefox as my main browser, I liked the fact that I could just open the URL bar, like here. Let me try this live, because this is a Mac, but the same thing happens on a Mac, if I can get this thing to shrink down. Okay, if I go to Firefox, which I think I have running somewhere. Yeah, here's Firefox. Okay, if I open this, and I type in, it fills right up with news.google.com. If you start typing, it has a list of things you recently typed, and it fills them right in. 
Now the Brave browser, which is what I switched to, does not seem to do that. Oh, it does now, good. Anyway, that's typed URLs. That's the purpose of it. It knows when you type what you tend to type. So it has a special place to record what you have typed into that bar. And the point of this for a forensic investigator is this means you really deliberately went to that page. You didn't just click a link. And so this is useful for things like um, inappropriate stuff at work, like porn or games or something. You can say, you typed that URL in the bar. You can't tell me you just accidentally ended up on the forbidden page. Anyway, that's what they are. So when you type, you'll see these shortcuts created here, matching the first few letters of what you type. If you clear the history, this does not go away. The history is a whole different thing. The only way to clear this is to go into this registry key and delete stuff. That's why that's the problem. Um, clearing there, a lot of people think that emptying the trash bin and clearing the history is hiding their traces, and it's not at all. It's just making it take a little bit more knowledge to find your traces. Your traces are all over the place. Anything short of reform of actually forensically erasing a whole hard drive is an illusion. And uh, no, if you have an image-based backup and you restore it, that does not remove this stuff because it doesn't erase the whole drive. You still have old files in the part of the drive that has not been used. For example, wiping out the operating system, reformatting the drive, and installing a new operating system on it does not erase this stuff. No, no, this stuff is in the registry. It is. So if you roll the entire machine back to an image you made a month ago, then it will no longer be in the current living registry, but the old registry still exists in the unallocated sectors on the hard drive and can be recovered with a forensic tool like NCASE or FTK. That's the problem. I mean, there was a, this, one of my forensic instructors talked about this. There was a, um, a suspect and they had a lawyer and they, got a search warrant, and then they found out that this person had a laptop they didn't know about, so they got another search warrant and called them, we want this laptop, and said, gee, I'm sorry, I sold that laptop to my lawyer, and my lawyer reformatted it and reinstalled the OS. And the forensic examiner said, that's no problem, I want it anyway, the evidence will still be on there. And then they decided to settle the case because they knew they were screwed. But nothing cleans the disk except really forensic erasing, which takes hours. You have to write zeros on every sector. If you just move some files around or take off the files and put on other files, a lot of it has not been erased. Uh, the simplest, you can zero it from the command line. You go to, it will take a long time and there's no way out of that. It, because it, it has a certain write speed and you have to write on every sector. So it will typically take hours. No, I don't think it's out of the day. I haven't known it to be days, but I suppose it could. It's just the question is how fast can it write? And um, I, I think different hard drives have different ratings. I know USB drives can take a very long time. Um, but it, it's just a question. You'll, you, you, you do have to write to every sector. So if you've got a two terabyte hard drive, you have to write two terabytes of data. And that will take however long it takes. Nobody that anymore. 16 terabyte. Yeah. yeah, I haven't bought a hard drive in a long time. Yeah. Is there a tool that you know, maybe like zero to one to on a, on a empty space in hard drive? Yeah, there, there's a lot of tools that do it. There's, there's thing called Erasure that does it. Uh, you don't need any tool. You can do it right from command line with um, select disk and clean all. I think it's F disk, select disk, clean all. There's some with normal command line commands that will do it. But you can download Erasure if you want a GUI-based application that will do it. That will, that will write zeros on the whole hard drive, deleting everything. No, but then, but then I want to, you know, if I have an operating system on there, I want only want to delete, only want to write to the empty space. Yeah, if you want to do that, there's a tool called Steganography you can install, which will now write zeros every time you delete a file which is what you're describing. It will, only, it will clean everything you're not using. And that's, there are that's tools to use. Yes. Now the problem is it won't clean whatever is on there before that. But still, that's, it is for that reason. And what this means is every time you delete a file, it will now have to take more time to really erase it. But that might be what you want. Yeah, these so are good still, points. So there's no tool to, you know, 
try to the in the hard drive. I'm, I'm, steganography might be able to do that. I'm not sure. It's right to the currently unallocated spaces. But what you could do is back up your stuff, wipe out the whole hard drive, and then put it back. And that's what I would do to be safe. But you know, this is an issue. I mean, if you're well, trying you to make a big file. Yeah, well, I mean, there's already an image based backup in Windows, although they made it mighty hard to get to. Because ever since Windows 8, Microsoft seems to no longer believe we should be using image based backup. They think everybody should have a deployment server. Because they only think about corporations. They really don't seem to care about home users and small businesses. So they think everybody is going to set up a license server and a deployment server and all a domain and all this fancy stuff. They used to have in Windows 7 a competing image backup, which is appropriate for home users. But they always, uh, that stuff is always an afterthought. Anyway. Yes, I say steganography will do it. I think there are files that will try, there are tools that will try to do it. But anyway, it is a very common issue. I, many, many people believe when you delete something and empty the recycle bin, that stuff is gone. And that is not true at all. Anyway, so um, there's the remote desktop. If you connect with the remote desktop, like you people are doing here, if you use these cloud machines, it's recording everything that happens there too, of course. If you're using a remote desktop, you're logged in as a user and you have Windows settings and stuff and it wants to remember them. It has special places to record who's been using remote desktop at what time. And so if you want to analyze the registry, there are a bunch of special tools. You could just use regedit to see the live registry, but if you have captured a forensic image with the registry files, then you want a tool that will put it back together. And there's quite a few different tools out there to be used to reconstruct the registry and search through it and analyze it. And there's a lot of single purpose utilities just for things like shell bags and the shim cache and so on. There are tools just to find these particularly important forensic item packs because if you just look at the registry, a lot of this stuff is hard to read. It's in some goofy binary format in the registry. So running a tool like shell bags will take the data and present it in a readable form, file name, creation time, and so on. So I've got a few cahoots about that. This is 12B3. And let's see, I have a chat message. Does Splunk track those NT network service accounts? I think it does if you use uh, Sysmon. I, and Sysmon, I think, records every uh, authentication event, including service accounts. But I haven't exactly tested it, but I believe Splunk does do that, if you have Sysmon. And everybody running Windows really needs Sysmon. So here is 12. B3, which is here. And I should have some sound. And this, okay. And I think I've realized I should put it on this side to make it easier for people in the classroom to see it. And I should uh, get that on the way and save this. And I think I saw another chat message up there. Let's see what's happening. If wiping SSD the same process, no. This is actually a very good question. Um, SSDs do not need this kind of erasing. It depends on your SSD. If your SSD is old, or if your operating system is old, or if your driver is not modern, then your SSD acts just like a hard drive, and you'd have to erase it the same way. But if you have a modern operating system and a modern SSD, then your SSD has a thing called garbage collection that automatically zeroes out sectors you're not using almost all the time. But it doesn't necessarily get them all. What it's doing is taking 640 kilobyte pages of data and arranging the used sectors to make them empty and then erasing them. The reason is you cannot erase just one sector of an SSD. You must erase 640 kilobytes all at once, and that takes considerable time. So your SSD would be really slow if you let the old data just sit there. When you tried to save something new, it would have to spend time erasing a whole page of data to make room for the new data. So to avoid that, when you're doing nothing else, it clears, it rearranges the data like defragmentation to empty out pages, and then it erases the pages. So it doesn't necessarily erase 100% of the data that's not in use, but in my tests, it gets like 99% of it. I wrote some programs that will fill an SSD with data and then look a few seconds later to watch it evaporate. And most of it's gone, but not all of it. Yeah? I have a question related to that. Um, 
Yeah. What you're describing, is that wear leveling or is that something different? Wear leveling is different. Wear leveling is the older thing. Old SSDs, like more than 10 years ago, used to have only a certain number of write cycles before they were no good. So it would make a big deal of trying to rotate the sectors like you'd rotate tires on a car. That I think is not relevant for modern SSDs. But this is a similar issue um, because this also this has the effect not only of making it faster, but making avoiding unnecessary erasing processes, which would in principle wear it out, although wearing out is no longer the concern. The main concern is speed. The reason I ask, um, I have um, a service ticket on the Mac that was older, and it had one of those fusion factors. Um, and the only way I could figure out to, um, I couldn't just zero it, was a foot and leg. So I yeah, it, well, here's, here's the nasty part. SSDs cannot be forensically erased at all because SSDs have a high failure rate of pages. So if you buy a 100 gigabyte SSD, they actually give you extra data, like 105 gigabytes. And there are extra sectors that the computer does not know about. And when there's a write error, it replaces the bad sector with one that it pulls from the reserve. So when you think you're writing over the whole disk, you're not getting it all. Sectors that were perceived as bad are beyond your reach permanently. They're not in the map anywhere, and they do have data in them still. It'll call them bad because one bit was wrong, but there's still a bunch of data in there, and you can't erase them at all. That's why everybody just grinds physically, they physically grind up the hard drives and the SSDs. Because any so-called perfect eraser, like if you take Derek's boot and nuke and run the DOD wipe, you're fooling yourself. That's not really getting it all. Doesn't make any difference because if you have 10,000 sectors on the drive and you erase from sector one to 10,000, there are extra sectors that are not anywhere in that map that your computer does not know about. Only the hard drive firmware knows about it. And um, Travis Goodspeed hacked the firmware and replaced the firmware with hacked firmware so he could get it. And he was able to recover 50 megabytes of good data from a one terabyte magnetic hard drive that had been forensically erased. So this is why companies and law enforcement agencies have always said, just physically destroy the drive. Don't mess around. There is no way to ever really be sure you clean that thing off. Now what's the next best practice? Because this was just for a customer in a small office. Is our encrypted that graphic arrays the best thing you can do? It doesn't matter what you do as long as you write to every sector. One pass of zeros is plenty. The myth that you need multiple passes is from 20 years ago technology. No drive that anybody is using now has that problem. If you do anything that writes on all the writable sectors, then you've done all you can do, short of physically destroying the drive. The other is, the only thing you can do beyond that is sort of very extravagant, where you hack the drive firmware to get direct access to it. And that's what some hardware hackers do as a stunt, but it's, um, it's not what anybody would reasonably expect. Same thing's true of USB drives too. There's no way to completely erase them. That's why, you know, reusing old hardware is a risky thing. The only hardware that's safe to reuse is iPhones. Because iPhones are always encrypted when you, before you ever start using them. So every bit of data you ever put on them is encrypted. And when you do the factory reset, it just deletes the key. That works. And you could do that with Android and you could do that with Windows. If you turn on something like BitLocker from the very start, so before they put in any data, it's all encrypted. Now, even if it goes to some sector, you can never erase, it doesn't matter because it's encrypted. And when you delete the key, it's gone, gone, gone. So from what I understand, Yes, that's correct. It's not perfect. That's right. If you write to everything you can reach, then you have, it's sort of like the person that deletes the internet history. You have made it so normal people won't find it, but it's not like it's really gone. If some real forensic company like Drive Savers or the NSA or something wants to find it, there will still be some data in there. Of course, it probably, in most cases, it's not that important. It's just fragments of a file. But if you wanted to meet like a compliance regulation where I had like customer records and social security numbers and I want to sign a document saying, I made sure I wasn't leaking them, then I wouldn't be comfortable signing that document if you've been doing this practice and donating to like a school or something. Right. Yeah. yeah, just physically destroying the drive. Besides, drives lose their value really fast anyway. After a couple of years, people want a new drive anyway because it's bigger. So just physically destroying the drive in practice is a far better custom than trying to wipe it and believe it's really wiped. These are very good questions, very important ones. Anyway, yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's a very good question. If you have an encrypted drive and you want to copy data to a new drive, um, uh, I think if you're using something like Windows, uh, what you use, see, when you're actually using a drive, it's decrypted because you have to be able to read the data. So the key is in RAM. So typically, if you, if you move to a new drive, you decrypt it, copy it to a new drive, and then re-encrypt it on the new drive. That's typically what you do. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. If you have like a whole hard drive where you format it and you put new stuff on the whole hard drive, and you transfer that to the new drive, that's a lot of Just some other item that you erase on it, you get on the new drive? No. If you copy files from one drive to the next, it's only usually going to copy the active files, which are files that are currently in use. It's not going to take the empty sectors and copy them. And if you do something like make a ghost image and restore it, the default settings of Norton Ghost only copy the active data. Now, you can make a forensic image with Norton Ghost in forensic mode or with a forensic tool that copies every sector, and you could restore that to another drive. But that is not something any normal person would do because it's just slower and bigger, and you're copying the junk. It's like copying the stuff in the trash bin. Normal people wouldn't want it. The only people that do that are forensic examiners that really want every sector, including the unused sectors, because they're planning to restore those deleted files. I was talking about unused sector, and then there's information you the transfer the awesome? No, the inter a normal copy process does not copy anything but the active files, just to make it faster. That's a very good question. Yes. Kirk, what Kirk's doing is like uh, taking a computer and making a virtual machine or copying an operating system and putting it on a different machine. And that is just active data. That's the purpose of that is not to capture every bit on the drive, but to capture the running operating system so you can run it over here. So the only thing you want is the currently useful files. All the backup utilities only record that. So, so he has to copy the key to the other one, other than No, the key, if it's encrypted, that won't matter at all because when you run a program that reads the files, it will decrypt them. The encryption is done automatically. And when no, it no, reads the license, key. the license key, oh, the license key won't be accepted on a new machine anymore because they fingerprint the hardware. So when they take the license, uh, for example, Microsoft licenses, they think they take the serial number of the processor and the size of the hard drive and the MAC address of the NIC card and a bunch of numbers in the machine to look to see if you're on a different piece of hardware. And if you are, then they will bust you. This license is tied to that hardware. So, so, uh, so when Kurt moved uh, the image, uh, what happened to those keys? Uh, the keys will probably become invalid if they're single user keys. But, but he, he was, he was thinking Well, if you use some hacking tools, you can sometimes get the product key. Sometimes some product keys are not tied to the hardware, but Windows has been tied to the hardware since XP genuine advantage. However, I think Windows 10 is now free. Yeah. Uh, you can upgrade with Windows 10. Yeah. Unfortunately, it happens over some like the same as free for the invalid um, up to 90 days, and then it'll just start to harass you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. It's been true since Vista. All right. Yeah, yeah. Any, anyway, Microsoft licensing is very screwy and uh, kind of inconsistent. Anyway, let's. Sorry. Okay, no ten bias. professional. Oh wow, that's pretty good. Anyway, I guess I'll I'll start to use cahoots. I got six people. Let's carry on with that. This is good. We'll do at least one more section tonight, though. But so, um, all right. What identifies which programs have been used, but not who launched them? That's prefetch. Good. You folks remember that. That's good. All right. So, where do you have programs started from the start menu, but not from the command prompt?
Yes, user assist. It's there to help you type it. Anyway, um, all right. You know, the Windows command, you know, bash has a bash history. Windows doesn't seem to have that. If you close the command prompt and come back, it doesn't have the old stuff in it. As far as I can tell, that's one feature, a convenience feature that's missing from Windows. Anyway. Uh, you, if you if your window is open and you type a bunch of lines, you can use the upper to go back. But if you close that window and open a new window, it's gone. That's not true in Bash. Bash history is a really useful place to look for good stuff on Linux. But I'm not aware of a Bash history thing in Windows. That's like the only thing it doesn't have. But I think that's because no one expects you to do extensive work at the command line anymore. I wonder if PowerShell has it. I haven't tried that. But now that's the place where they actually expect you to be typing command line all day. And therefore, keeping a history of that would be something you might logically want. Anyway. At least on PowerShell. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But if you close it and come back, I think it's gone. Anyway, here, um, which one of these persists even if a directory is deleted? Okay, that's shell bags. And I see another chat comment, which is... How do you, after you close, it's gone as well. That's what I thought. Yeah, PowerShell doesn't seem to have a history like Bash. That's interesting. In, in CTF contests, by the way, like CCDC, the Bash history is awesome. People, they often forget and leave the administrative password in there and stuff. So anyway. Um, so which one proves that a user intentionally went to a website and didn't just click a link? All right, and that's, of course, typed URLs prove that you actually typed it. Okay, so let me record the winners here. All right. Um, and three for Anton. And three for... Okay. All right. Good. So, all right. Let me see if I can get this thing to stop making noise. All right. So let's take a look at the first section of the next one, and that'll be enough for today, I think. So this is just more Windows stuff, and now we're finally done with the registry. The registry took more than a whole class, and it deserves it. But there's a bunch more stuff beyond the registry. Uh, other inter we'll just do the other artifacts tonight, and then we'll do memory, forensics, and persistent mechanisms next time. So an interactive session is where you log in locally, on the keyboard, usually. You didn't just connect over the network and access something like a file share. So um, remote desktop sessions do count and screen sharing counts because you get your own desktop and therefore it records things like where you're storing windows and such. So there are shortcuts to files. Let me see if I can get this Kahoot junk out of the way. Okay, so um, link files are shortcuts in windows. They're what you call uh, um, links in Linux. And so these things are saved for every open file to populate recent files. So there's a separate list in each user profile so you know all the files that each user has recently been using. And they're stored in their profile. See users, username, app, data, roaming, and all that jazz. Because roaming profiles have been around for a long time. Roaming profiles are for corporate domains. So that if you go to another machine in the same company and log in with your domain account, it will populate it with all your preferences. You will have your desktop and your recent files and every your program menu and all that that's the point that's why it's up in roaming because that'll be traveling with you as you roam through the company so you've got the full path the share name you've got the source volume you've got all the timestamps, and you've got a unique identifier you know a lot of information there to record um what someone opened and where it came from and you've got a timeline. You can see just what they did, what files were accessed in what order. So if they're doing something like accessing your network shares and copying proprietary data and putting it on desktop and then dragging it into a folder and then zipping the folder and then throwing it in the trash can, you will see all that happen. It's very nice. So then there's jump lists. We think have been around since I think uh, Windows XP or something. You have these, the the taskbar, certainly in Windows 7, and this taskbar down here, if you right click that, it'll now show you the recent things that have been opened. So it has to keep a list of the recently opened items of all different types. 
So if you have Word and right-click Word, it will show you the recently opened Word files and so on. So these things are stored, again, in app data roaming and automatic destinations. Uh, they're not human readable. You have to download a special tool to extract the data, but it's all there. All that information is the most recently used files. Then, of course, the recycle bin is actually extremely complicated. If you open the recycle bin, you do not see the contents of the recycle bin. What you see is your contents of the recycle bin. You see the things that you throw away. But Microsoft is privacy conscious enough not to show you things that some other user threw away. So the recycle bin is actually a synthetic object. It's not just the contents of a folder. It is like a query into a database showing you only your stuff. But uh, that's the point. And by the way, not everything goes in the recycle bin. Only things deleted from the GUI go in there. And things deleted from external drives do not go in there because Microsoft is not willing to increase the storage on a hard drive to store copies of things that were never on the hard drive in the first place to put them in the recycle. Anyway, you have to get a special tool to see the real contents of the recycle bin, and then you'll see it all if you get this tool called RFI UT. Yes, I think it will. Um, I, oh, I think it's free. It's just a Python script. I mean, all these tools, um, and of course, if you get an expensive forensic suite like FTK or in case, it will do all this stuff automatically right in the GUI. But those things cost a lot of money. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Oh, it's not secret or anything. People, it's just, it's not like Microsoft is hiding it. They just stored it in some binary format and you just had to figure it out. That's all these are doing. They just parsed the binary format. Yeah. You know, just like the old Microsoft Word format. It's not like they were hiding anything. They just happened to store the data in some foolish binary format, which is kind of annoying. And so Microsoft finally got fed up with it all. And now they're pretty much using XML for everything because even they can't keep track of all these hundreds of goofy little binary formats all over the place. Um, and what happens, of course, Windows is like the Frankenstein monster. Microsoft did not write Windows. They buy companies and buy their stuff and then patch it into Windows, like sewing another arm or a head on this body. So a lot of their stuff is not obeying Microsoft coding conventions. They just sort of patch it in. So it's, um, it's an amalgamation of stuff, sort of like Linux. All these open source developers write stuff. It's not really all the same, and they just sort of throw it all in. Except for the kernel, where the iron hand of Linus Thorvalds makes sure that everything meets his standards in the kernel. But outside the kernel, it's just like a forest of people doing random things. And then there's memory forensics. If you image the memory, the memory, of course, has complete records of everything you're doing now. And by the way, it has an awful lot of old stuff left over from a long time ago. Microsoft is very strange about taking files on a disk and putting them in RAM for no apparent reason. So you'll find weird stuff in RAM from long ago, but the active RAM contains what you're doing right now. Running processes, network connections, user credentials, which used to be in plain text from browsers, although modern browsers seem to finally be wising up, not just leaving leftover plain text passwords in RAM the way they used to. And you got uh, remnants of previously executed console commands, and if you opened Notepad and typed something and closed it, sometimes that data is still just floating around in RAM. You know, a lot of, if you just define a variable in C and then you close the program, it didn't erase that variable from RAM, just like it didn't erase it from the hard disk, and it's just sitting there. Now, if you used Visual Studio and Visual Basic or Microsoft C and you used the right variable type, there is a variable type that will automatically erase it when you're not using it anymore, but it's not just the normal string variable type. There's a special secure string variable type. But programmers that don't use it that stuff is just sitting in RAM. Anyway, um, so there's physical RAM chips, and then there's the page file, because when you fill up RAM, then it takes blocks of RAM and writes them to the hard drive to free up RAM. So there is a hard disk file that has data that was moved out of RAM, and now that's on the hard drive, and now that is like left behind when you reformat, and, and that can be recovered from the hard drive. So that's pagefile.sys, and just Microsoft uses the page file in a very strange way. If you configure Linux with a swap partition and you have four gigs of RAM and you never use more than four gigs of RAM, there will be nothing on the swap partition, but Microsoft puts stuff on the page file all the time, even when memory is not full. It is very screwy. So you'll find stuff in there even when you haven't been filling up RAM. And then there's crash dumps. When the machine crashes, it automatically creates a crash dump. Now, typically it only makes a 
small memory dump, which doesn't have much of anything. It just has the kernel memory. And the kernel memory usually doesn't have any user data. But you can configure a complete memory dump. And if you do, then of course it's got everything in RAM stuck in that file. And that file is just sitting there. But that's not commonly done. And it's stored in local app data and you got a bunch of them. So this is one way to get an image of RAM, by the way, <laughs> is to just make a crash dump. Anyway, uh, and this is essentially what that utility we use in the um, uh, practical malware analysis class to do kernel debugging. We use this thing called live KD, and what it does is make a crash dump and then investigate the crash dump. So you can view the kernel on a running system. Anyway, um, then there's hibernation files. I don't know, now Microsoft, in the days of Windows XP and Windows 7, Microsoft had three modes of shutdown. There was power off, suspend, and hibernate. The power off turns off the power, all the RAM is erased, and anything not stored on the hard drive is gone. Suspend, does not turn off the hard drive or the RAM, it just turns off the screen to save power, and, but if the battery dies, everything will be lost, but it wakes up faster. And there is this thing called Hibernate, where it takes the contents of RAM and stores it on a hard drive in a thing called a hybrid file, and the power goes off completely. But when you open the machine again, it will restore right back where it was by putting that back in RAM, so all your web page will come back and all the documents you half wrote and didn't save will still be there and that's going to leave behind a full image of the ram in the hybrid file now since i think windows 8 and windows 10 microsoft now has some weird new shutdown mode that sort of mixes hibernate and suspend and i'm not really sure exactly what it puts in the hybrid file anymore it'll be interesting to see um, if they still creates this file and if it's still as simple as just a complete copy of ram but anyway um Anyway, Microsoft's file was uncompressed and unencrypted. So if you had four gigs of RAM, there would just be a file there, four gigs in size. Now, Apple's, for at least the last eight years, Apple's have been compressing RAM, which is a brilliant idea. If you have four gigs of RAM on a Mac and you open more than four gigs of running programs, it will not start putting it on the hard drive, which is a thousand times slower than RAM. It will zip the RAM, which is very fast and very smart. And I don't think Microsoft has learned to do this yet. But it is a very smart idea. But I always wondered why they don't zip this hybrid file, because it's really stupid to wait for those four gigs of junk to read off the hard drive. Anyway, um, and they might be doing it now, but I think they still are not. I think they just use it in a very simple way. And I don't know why, because Apple led the way. If you just zip the RAM, you could have three times as much RAM. It would be almost as fast. It's a great idea. It also means that none of this stuff works on the Mac. If you make an image of the RAM on the Mac, you've got this compressed crap. And the only way to read it is to pay like a thousand bucks for black bag. You have to pay for a professional tool to unzip that junk. It's Mac forensics is hard. They keep changing everything and all the tools are really expensive and all the free tools only work for like 10 years ago versions. So no, it's not the chip itself. The chip itself doesn't, it's the operating system that does it. So it's, but the, the, the Windows has free tools to do almost everything. But, I have a Mac desktop and I have yeah. like a genetic brand name it's already a memory that I bought. Yeah, you can have any brand of chip. That doesn't matter. I don't think it matters. Now, SSDs, by the way, it does matter. The brand of the SSD changes the driver and that changes the way it performs. So for example, if you have a MacBook Air with the built-in SSD, then it will do garbage collection. But if you buy a third party SSD and put it in, it probably won't because the driver won't support it. At least that was true maybe six years ago when I looked into it. Um, I've been doing a search for SSD and there's a few SSD hybrids like they are from Seagate, like yeah. one terabyte, two terabyte. Yeah. And there is a uh, fake SSD compared to a hybrid SSD. Yeah, there's a lot of different kinds. And of course, nobody much cares about their data remnants, which is what we're talking about here. Most people only care about performance under normal conditions. Which is the best performance that there is from SanDisk also SSD drive? I don't really know. I'm not an expert on performance. Anyway, um, so then of course, volatility is a tool you can run and it will take a memory image and it will parse it by knowing the operating system. You have to tell it what operating system you got it from and it will then find all kinds of good stuff. You can get command lines. You can even open notepad text. It'll show it to you. You can see the network connections and all this stuff. 
Now, I used to have projects where you did volatility, but what I tried to do recently, it didn't seem to work on Server 2016, but I checked today, and volatility has supposedly been updated for 2016, so there might is some version that could parse 2016 mem dumps. So next time I teach this class, I might try to get that working. When you get it working, you take an image and you run volatility. And see, here's one on Windows 2008. You have to tell it exactly which version you have, and then it will take a memory dump and it will put stuff together, like it'll show you the, the running processes, just like Task Manager and the network connections and all kinds of goodies. It can just reconstruct everything that was happening on that machine. But you have to have a special tool to do this because it's, it's, uh, it's not easy to just read the RAM in a hex viewer. It has to find the marks and reconstruct these objects from the file system. It's very much like a registry viewer. Anyway, um, so I got some cahoots about that. I think that's enough for today. 12C1 is here. And all right. I know, you know, Ron Jeremy is a really ugly guy, and he's in a, and he's, he's a really ugly guy, and he's in a business where that ought to matter, you know, I mean, I would think. Well, I guess, this is, I don't know, it seems to me like this is a profession where looks matter, and he is really no longer qualified for the business, but they failed to ask my advice. I, I guess. Anyway, I think he should have retired 20 years ago, personally, but people fail to ask my advice on so many important topics. Anyway, um, anyway, uh, apparently he has one fan in the class, anyway. So, all right, so, anyway. Um, which item contains only kernel memory by default? Okay, crash dump? Yeah. All right. Which item can only be gathered with a live acquisition? Vault's RAM, of course. All the rest of those things are on the hard drive, but RAM you have to grab from a running system. All right. Which one of these has the entire contents of RAM? Okay, the hybrid file always does. The crash dump only would if you configured it to do that, and that's not usually the case. But the hybrid file always has a whole image of RAM. How do you clean up the RAM memories? Just uh, if you turn off the power, RAM is erased. So it's not there in the RAM? It doesn't, if, uh, if you cool the RAM, it will remember for 10 minutes. At room temperature, it only remembers for a few seconds. So turning off the power is normally good enough. It does have memory, but... Well, the, the RAM has no memory. There's ROM that has memory, but the, and, and, but the RAM forgets when the power is turned off. It evaporates within a few seconds, typically. Why people check the RAM? What's that? Why does people always check the RAM? The only reason they check the RAM is to see if you have enough. Because it's the most common reason a machine runs slowly is you don't have enough RAM. That's all. And sometimes they buy a different kind of RAM to make it faster. That's all. It's just a matter of speed. The no normal person cares about how long the data persists. The only person that would care about that would be a forensic examiner. Normal users are oblivious to that sort of thing. And which item appears when you right click a taskbar like this? That's the jump list. <laughs> 
that thing in Windows 7 where you right click that thing on the bottom and it shows you recently used objects of that type. So we've got M Hino. And uh, Anton Twice. And WK Twice. Okay, good. So those are the winners. And all right, so I'm not going to add any more projects in this class except extra credit projects. And as I said before, I am in fact writing a lot of new extra credit projects as the semester is coming to an end, but I don't care. I've got Black Hat Asia coming up. I've got other things. I, don't know, I need a lot of projects. So I'm continuing to write them. But I don't imagine very many students will be doing them this semester, but people will be doing them in other countries and stuff. So this Chrome desktop on a Cloud Linux server is pretty cool. And I'll have Kimu. And the other one that I mentioned in class was the uh, malware analysis, which is this one, uh, Box. Box is a Windows-based tool, very easy to use. And it, again, lets you run things that look like virtual machines, like here. So I'm running um, DOS here on top of Windows 2016 down here. And the point of that is you can analyze the bootloader and such. So the point of it in the malware analysis class is to start seeing how bootkits work, which are more primitive than rootkits, hardware viruses, essentially. And in 127, I want to have a lot of operating systems practice attacks. Anyway, so that's, that's the latest stuff I've been developing. Uh, but as far as this class directly is concerned, I think all the projects are pretty much up there. I don't expect to add any more. The last one is this Avanti thing. And the Avanti thing is pretty miserable. If you get fed up with it, just do some Splunk or something. So if you get tired of doing these projects, you can do Splunk or Go and make a ton of extra credit. So the Splunk, Basel SOC 1 is here. Basel SOC 2 is actually quite difficult. I wouldn't bother with it until you're done with Basel SOC 1. And if you want something that's really not very difficult, go to the Go the wrong way. This is 300 points worth of stuff that's pretty easy to do. Um, and one thing I should mention, I see students just trying to do it in order. Each one of these projects has the easy part first and then harder and harder challenges. So if you're trying to get a lot of points quickly, just do the easy part of each one. The hard parts are hard, of course. It's not like it gets harder monotonically as you go up. Each one of them starts with an easy part and then has hard parts at the end. So do a fast pass through. This is true of Capture the Flag contest too. Don't work on problem one and struggle. Take a quick look at every problem. And do, so find the easy ones and then go back. This is a very common mistake. You get bogged down on one or two and you never look at the others and it turns out there's a bunch of stuff that would have been easy. So that's a good policy. Always take a look at everything before you waste a lot of time doing something hard. Anyway, any questions about anything? All right, I'm going to stop the recording.